going here. Okay. Okay, I'm here with Lonnie Olson, the founder of Dog Scouts of America, which is a nonprofit that organizes Dog Scout Camp, where you and your dog can spend the week hiking, building skills, and making new furry and human friends. And just like in Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, your dog can earn merit badges too. Um, tons of cool badges at the Dog Scouts of America website, dogscouts.org. And Lonnie, the founder, is a published author and speaker teaching clicker training and flyball. She's won the Maxwell Award from the Dog Writers Association and honor honorary life membership from the National Association of Dog Obedience Instructors. Lonnie is a firm believer that dogs enjoy playing, learning, and spending time with their owners, and she created a nonprofit to do just that. Again, you can learn all about it at dogscouts.org. And Lonnie, welcome. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So why don't you fill in anything I may have missed there in the intro, and we'll get right into Dog Scouts. I think you covered it pretty well. Okay. Found it good. <laughs> all right, home run. <laughs> so let's get right into the story of how in the world did you come up with the idea to make uh, Dog Scouts of America? Well, it uh, started back in 1987. I had a young border collie and she was the coolest dog ever. And she was so smart and did everything. And uh, one day I can remember sitting in my bedroom just petting her head and saying, oh, Carly, you're such a cool dog. One of these times I got to take you to camp. At that time, the only camps were like camps where you could go. I was a uh, uh, repeat attendee at some camps that taught you how to be a better dog obedience instructor and a better class instructor. So as soon as the words left my mouth, I thought, whoa, wait a minute, what am I saying? This is a dog that I promised she would never have to see the inside of an obedience ring, much less the inside of a training collar, you know, and this, this camp was all about straighter fronts and quicker sits and all these things. And I'm like, she doesn't want to do that. She wants to go to a camp where a dog can run and play and do frisbee and herding and all the things that we've been doing together. And I said, well, too bad there's not such a camp. And um, I thought, well, man, there, there needs to be one. So I thought, well, who, who would host such a camp? And I'm like, well, <laughs> dummy, what have you been doing with your life for the past several years? You've devoted every minute of your time to having the dogs do herding and frisbee and fly ball and all these cool things. I'm the perfect person. So I, I had it all planned out and everything. And then just as I was getting ready to have my ad, I had my instructors and my <clears throat> curriculum and my um, site, and everything all planned out. And I opened up my off lead magazine and guess what? There was an ad that says, come to camp, learn Frisbee, fly ball, <laughs> and all this. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> they had the same idea I did. And um, I'm like, well, now I don't have to do that because now there is a dog camp where you can go and go have fun with your dogs. And of course, that was uh, Camp Gone to the Dogs. And um, I, over the years, I just thought, well, that's not, and I never managed to go to Camp Gone to, to the Dogs. But um, over the years, uh, I just kept doing fun things with my dog. And then one day, there was an insurance guy in my home. And you know how they make small talk pretending they're interested. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, be more like. And so behind me on the wall of my dining room, there were all these big blown up pictures like you'd have of your children if you had children. And it's my dogs, you know, herding and winning frisbee competitions and standing there with big trophies and all this stuff. And so he's like, what's with all this stuff on your wall? Why do you have all these pictures of the dogs? And I said, well, that's, that's what I do with my dogs. And I explained a little and he says, I still don't get it. And I said, well, you, you had kids? And he goes, yeah, I had a boy and a girl. And I said, well, were they interested in band and cheerleading and wrestling and football and Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts? And he goes, yeah. I said, well, and you were their chauffeur, right? You took them to all these things and, and supported them and, and followed along. And he goes, yeah. And he says, I still don't get it. I mean, because like, it's a dog, right? right. He wasn't getting it. So when I spoke those words, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, I thought, you know what? Missing is Dog Scouts. And the very next day, I called my lawyer and I said, look, I need to patent something. <laughs> I need to I need to get a copyright on something. This is a cool idea. I've had cool ideas before and didn't pursue, you know, getting them locked down. And um, and then somebody else has come up with them. And then, you know, 
I think oh, I should have done it, but so I did. And um, that's how Dog Scouts got created. My border collie gave me the first idea to have camps in the first place, but it was nine years later when I thought of the um, scouting idea. And then I thought, well, now we got to have a camp. And by that time, a bunch of other people had copied along and, and started having dog camps. So it wasn't like I was number two or number three or number four. You know, it's like I was number seven. You know, I didn't want to look like I copied them when in fact I had that idea way back when there were no camps, you know. So I just um I thought, well, let's let's do it. Let's have let's have a dog scout camp. So where is your camp? Uh now we have our camp um at some property we purchased in northern Michigan in the St. Helen area. And uh, before that, we had rented out other camps, like kids camps, uh, church camps, stuff like that. And um, we were spending a lot of money renting camps each year. And we thought, what if we just bought some property? And, and then each year, um, instead of paying money out to somebody else for mm -hmm. rent, we'd be putting it toward owning the property. So someday we'll have property and everything will be free and clear. And we don't have to worry where our money's going to come from but um for now uh, we've got a beautiful piece of property in the north woods of michigan it's got a pond and lots of trails and um, it's a fun place to be so how often are camps going on during the year and what does an owner experience when they go to camp well we have two camps each year one in july and one in june and um the uh <clears throat> We used to have more camps till 9-11 happened. You can cut this out of the, out of the interview if you want to, but um, it's like people stopped leaving home. You know, they were hmm. concerned about traveling and being away. I mean, we had just had our mini camp right before the weekend of 9-11. And um, I thought, wow, what if, what if that would have happened during our camp weekend? That would have been so scary and people wouldn't have been able to, well, not too many of them fly home anyway. They, there's, we do have campers from California and Florida and Texas and stuff come, and, but they mostly drive or they'll fly to a relative's house that's nearby and then, you know, drive or rent, a, rent an RV and come, come to camp. But um, what, the, what they can expect when they get to camp is, um, let's see we've got a whole section of the website that tells them why they should not come to camp <laughs> because <laughs> we have mosquitoes and sand and all this. And if they're expecting some kind of club med experience, um, that that's not what we do. We do, it's a dog centered camp with dog centered activities. So we've got our agility, permanent agility field there. And we've got a permanent, um, woodsy dog play area where the, the dogs I don't think even realize they're in a fenced area it's big and they can run around and um, be safe in, in an enclosed area we have a um, a lure coursing field where we do all kinds of fun activities with the lure like uh, well regular lure casing, coursing steeplechase and um, agilure and uh, frisbee we do frisbee out there as well and, so, um, so when pe people show up, they stay in a in a in a cabin or what? Yeah, they can. Um, they uh, when they come in, they'll check in and go to their housing, which could be a private room in the lodge or a group room, shared room in the lodge, or we have private cabins as well. The cabins have air conditioning and um, and heat, uh, but no restroom because we just didn't want to deal with plumbing in the winter time, you know, in Michigan. So there's a uh, there's an outhouse centrally located where the cabins are and it's really not that far to just walk to the lodge um, to use the lodge. And how, and how long is camp? It's a week. It's uh, six days basically. And uh, in that time, um, they've got time to, you know, I've been to camps and I'm not putting down other camps, but I've been to camps where uh, their schedule includes like an hour of tracking or an hour of freestyle dance hour of this and that and then that's all they say i hope you enjoyed it if you like this go do it on your own but at our camp we have a stepwise training so that on day one they learn some baby steps and then get some homework and then on day two we continue on with that until the dog actually can learn enough skills to get the badge by the end of camp and it's just phenomenal we have we have a texas camp now that's run by some wonderful individuals down there and um 
the one guy is a is a FEMA search and rescue dude, and mm -hmm. he's um, hardcore into the, the you know battle dress uniforms and the dogs trained to perfection and everything. And he taught some scent work. Uh, well, he continues to teach scent work at their camp. And uh, the first couple of years when he was there, he'd, he'd go back to his buddies in, in, you know, search and rescue, you know, the hardcore buddies. And um, he'd say, they'd say, so you're teaching a bunch of basically housewives, you know, how to do search and rescue and stuff with their dogs and scent work. And he, he's like, yeah. And he just, and they do it over a four day weekend because there's just a mini camp like, and um, he says, yeah, that's right. And he goes, how, how do they get their dogs to that? degree of perfection in four days he says it's phenomenal i don't know how to explain it to you other than the relationship these dog scout people have with their dogs hmm. they can they can learn all this stuff because they've learned to learn and they love to learn and they have that bond with their owners and just um they they, they can pick up stuff super fast hmm. Interesting. So you said they've learned to learn. Can you share more about that and how someone listening might um, take away some of your thoughts there and, and learn how to learn? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, it's uh, from the time a dog's a puppy and he comes into your home, he can start learning stuff immediately. A lot of people have been told that they can't start training a dog till he's six months old. That stems from the old fashioned um, training methods that were punishment based. And they suggested that the dog be six months old so he could handle the punishment that was being um, hmm. delivered to him. Plus the rabies shots, because uh, years ago they would wait till six months of age to give the rabies shot uh, so the dog would be protected um, in a class situation. But um, the dog has a full adult brain at seven weeks of age. And so you should start training them immediately. And if you don't, um, they will learn uh, stuff on their own. And it might not be good stuff. <laughs> it might be how to rip the siding off the house because he's bored or something. So um, what you need to do is from a very early age, one of the first things I teach my puppies is eye contact. Just call it the eye contact game. Mm -hmm. And so they learn that they're safe to look at me and that that's always a rewardable behavior. And then I teach so them. So how does that work, the oh. eye contact game? Well, um, you, show, you show them a little piece of food and you put it up by their nose and then you move it out to your arm's length. And um, most dogs will stand there and stare at the treat that's out at the end of your arm. And you just let them stare and let them stare until, until they look, until they get disgusted. They might even sigh, you know, and they'll look at you like, what is wrong with you? I can't reach that treat out there at the end of your arm. And the moment they look at you instead of the treat, boom, you pop it into their mouth. Mm. So um, they learn that, oh, it was that easy. All I had to do was look at you to get the treat. Super, super simple. I can do this all day long. So um, they're learning a positive method and they're they're learning that it's safe to look at us because a lot of dogs find, untrained dogs find eye contact as um, kind of challenging or whatever, um, threatening. But um, from the beginning, we teach the puppies that eye contact's a good thing. And then we teach them things like, leave it and um you know the basic stuff like and what's leave it oh leave it <laughs> well it's a lot like eye contact these are what we call indirect access exercises where the, the dog cannot act on impulse and just mug your hand and leap up and chew your chew it out of your fingers they had to learn to control their impulses so with leave it it's the same thing so um you could start with a treat in your hand and show him the treat and then if he goes for it roll up your fingers and don't let him have the treat and then um, again if he if he makes any movement to stop staring at clawing at or licking at your hand and he maybe looks away or looks up at you ideally um, then you open your hand and give him the treat so they learn oh man it was that simple again I didn't have to try to scratch and dig it out of her palm I could just look at her and she gives it to me so um, then, you know, we don't name it anything in the beginning because it's clicker training. So you wait till you have the behavior. And once they, they see, the, see the trainer with the food and they go, you can't fool me. And they look up uh, adoringly at the trainer. Um, then you, you can start calling it leave it. You name, you name the behavior after you have the behavior. So um, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty important one, the leave it. So w when you say name the behavior after the behavior, you mean... 
once they have learned the trick or the behavior, then you, you say to them, leave it. Then you put it on cue. Yeah. It's what we call putting okay. it on cue. So then you can ask for that behavior if they've forgotten themselves, they should always leave stuff if they haven't been told they could have it, but you know, they may forget themselves if you're fishing and they see a dead fish over on the bank and they want to go eat it, roll in it or whatever. And you can just remind them would leave it. And they know right away. That means don't look at it. Don't touch it. Don't molest it. Don't swallow it. Walk away from it. So well, what's uh, maybe one more puppy trick and then we'll get into um, maybe a few adult tricks. Okay, um, let's see. Well, it's important for puppies to not jump up because you should never let a puppy do something that won't be welcome in an adult dog when he weighs 80 pounds. So um, we teach them four on the floor. And again, it's super simple. Um, you just reward them when they're all four feet are on the floor. If they're jumping up, they get nothing. If they're being in their brain and um, sitting or lying down or standing with all four feet on the floor, that's a rewardable position. So you give them a treat. And again, they're like thinking to themselves, it's just that simple again, isn't it? <laughs> all I had to do was not act like a maniac and food comes my way. So um, those are all things. But so by learning to learn that when you've taught them things from, from a tiny toddler, um, then when they're older, you can teach an old dog new tricks, but it really helps if they've learned to learn by starting training at a, at a young age, mm -hmm. uh, seeing how the system works. So the, those three examples you gave there were, were, were basically examples of kind of, of training dogs not to do certain things. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like by doing so, you were actually training them to do certain things, which is, mm -hmm. you know, to say, to stay or to sit. Mm -hmm. um, You're setting to, them up for wait. success. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, when it comes to adult, so what about, what about tricks that are a little bit more action oriented? What are some of your favorites there, whether puppies or adults? Okay. Well, do you want to get into my list of favorite tricks? Yeah, let's get into maybe five or so of, of your favorite tricks and as much as possible, try, uh, do your best to explain, you know, to someone listening how they would actually go about doing this trick. Okay, well, one thing that we encourage all of our campers to do is take the painting class. And this is dogs Paint, painting. painting. Yeah, the dogs do the painting. And um, the reason why, um, again, you can edit this out if you want to, but um, <laughs> my, I have a good friend, Terry Ryan, and she's a well-known um, trainer in the United States. And um, she was talking to me one time. She wanted to start having camps. And she says, what should I do? Should I, should I get rats and skinner boxes so people can come to camp and learn how to train a rat you know and see how to how clicker training goes or should i you know use chickens or you know she was having a quandary and i said well the skinner boxes seem seem expensive and labor intensive you're gonna have to clean them all up and stuff she did end up eventually going with the chicken camps so she's famous for teaching the chicken training camps because once you've trained a chicken, you're probably wondering what that's got to do with dog training, but once you've clicker trained a chicken, you've got a very good handle on how to clicker train anything, basically. Hmm. So um, I started thinking about the same question. We hung up and, uh, on the phone and I said, what, what would I do? I don't want to have chickens or rats at my camp. What is something <laughs> that every person brings to camp with them? Well, their dog. So why don't we try to teach the dog something so out of the realm of their normal behaviors that it's almost impossible to believe. So I said, let's just teach the dogs to paint because it's not something they would just go do on their own, right? So it'd be a lot like training a chicken or a, or a rat. So um, anyway, I, do you want me to just get started from step one on how you teach the painting? Yes, please. Uh, so did I adequately explain, explain why we teach the painting because Again, it, once they see how easy clicker training is and they can do something as ridiculous as having their dog paint a picture, then they're going to say to themselves, why haven't I been using these methods to teach all the obedience and everyday stuff? So um, you start with um, a behavior called the wave. And um, basically, you have something the dog likes, like a, a, a treat, a cookie, something. and um, you uh, put it in your hand and um, show the dog the treat. And um, he'll, he might try nuzzling it with his nose and stuff, but eventually he'll get 
he'll get tired of doing that and he'll try a paw. So when he smacks your hand with his paw, you open the hand and he gets the treat. So he's saying, hmm, okay, it's like a slot machine. I smack the paw and the food comes out the, the little palm. So um, an interesting story. Again, you can edit this out if you want, but um, I went to <laughs> do some seminars on fly ball and, um, and on uh, clicker training. And I gave them homework the first day. And I said, go home. Everybody has to come back with a wave on your dog. And uh, so, the, so the next day, the, I was like seven minutes. It was seven minutes before the lecture was supposed to start. And this guy walks in and he's baked me a cake because he's a baker for a living. And I said, well, that's really nice, but did you teach your dog to wave? And he goes, well, I, I didn't have time to teach. I said, you didn't have time to teach your dog to wave. So we're, I just leaned back and sat on a desk there in the training room, and, and I had treats in my pocket, and we're just talking. And in the, in the seven minutes between when I started speaking to him and when the lecture started, that dog was waving. Well. While I'm talking to him, he didn't realize that I'm training his dog to wave. I just, you know, showed the dog. It was like a, a Rottweiler mix or something. And I, you know, show him my... And, that, that quick seven minutes so I really made him feel bad I said you know you couldn't have spared seven minutes for your dog instead of baking me that cake <laughs> but it's it's a lot of times they learn it so quick like that because they figure it out I mean they're... and so what's this what's the progression from waving to painting okay so once you get them uh, well first you have to move your hand away because so that they're just waving in the air so and they're um, just waving when you say wave Yes, you can add the cue. If they're doing it all the time, you can add the cue. But you don't want to add the cue before the dog's got the full behavior because then he'll think that half of a behavior is what the cue means, and you don't want him to give him half <clears throat> performances. So um, the, uh, the next thing, once you get him like waving in the air by, you know, you've got your hand here and he's reaching for it, but you pull it out of the way and it looks more like a wave. Then you teach the dog to um, wave in front of a like we use trays, like a board. Um, some places use, uh, you know, you can buy those canvas covered painting things that you're going to paint on and they're mm -hmm. already kind of stiff. But um, we, we take a tray and we teach the dog to wave. And when he makes contact with the tray, he gets clipped and treated. Again, we don't, we're not naming this yet because it's not finished. So He's, he's making strokes on the on the tray. First, he might just make one stroke and you, oh boy, oh boy, that was the thing to do. So he's like, okay, I, I got your number now. And, the, and so you got to up the ante. So now I want two strokes before you get the treat. So he does one stroke and he sits there and he's like, well, this always worked before, it's broken. And pretty soon he starts doing basically an extinction burst where he's like, this was working before, now I, you know, so then he'll start doing a whole bunch and boy, you jackpot that, you make him say, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted, multiple strokes. So, and, and while you're at it, you can tweak it to be like longer strokes because you don't want him doing, you know, just putting his foot all over. You want, it, you want him to like stroke the, mm -hmm. the canvas and it helps if he's not curling his nails too. But then the next step is we get him used to wearing a paint and paw on their hand. So on their paw. So it's this little Can device. Can you call it again? Paint, paint and paint, paw? Paint and paw. Yeah, paint I paw. created it. And it's basically a, a, I took the, I modeled it from, I used to do dog sled racing. And so um, the little booties you put on the dog to keep okay. the ice out of their toes. And then we just added a little piece of Velcro across uh, the top. Um, and you, you put this painting sponge in there and then you dip the sponge in the paint. and. Uh, and then and let him let him wave. So um, you got to you've got to get the dog used to all these steps, you know, one at a time. He's not just going to sit down and paint with with everything. Uh, another aside, another story. While I was in Australia, I was staying with uh, some folks that were hosting me while I was there doing the seminars, and I and they were a young couple. And I said, "Is there anything you wanted Tilly to learn um, while I'm here?" And they and they both looked at each other and said, "Yeah." wash the dishes you know apparently there was a big argument in the family about you know the dishwashing chore so i said okay well we'll see so unbeknownst to the <laughs> wife i took the husband out we bought like a little sponge and I, I cut it with a razor so her little tiny paw would fit into the slot of the sponge um we bought little plastic plates we had a dish strainer there and then um, 
you know, we're going through all this process to teach the dog to, it's just like teaching her to paint, only she was washing a dish, right? So I says, now we need to add the soap. And she, he goes, she's going to use soap? I said, yeah, how else do you expect her to wash the dishes? I mean, and <laughs> might object to the smell. So you have to get her used to all this stuff. So then on the final day of the seminar, um, the wife was there. And I said, we have a special surprise for her. And we got Tilly up there. And we got the soapy, soapy sponge. And she, she was actually washing the dish. And it was just precious. The woman was in tears. But it's just basically the painting behavior. Um, I'm sorry, I went on to that long story, but anyway, um, uh, so I, I think the episode title, how to teach your dog to wash your dishes would get some attention. So we might have to go with that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, back to the painting again, you want to get them used to everything individually wearing the paw, um, and, and only painting with one hand. I mean, if you teach them, if they're left-handed, you want to go with only clicking it when they do it with their left paw, but um, once you put the paint paw on, suddenly their paws broke and they might want to, you know, use their other paw, but they, they have to have learned to always only use the paw that you want them to paint with. Some people want to get lazy and put paint and paws on both paws, so no matter what they do, they'll paint. But um, anyway, then once you're getting the dog to accept the paw on, do the strokes, don't be afraid of the smell of the paint, and, and just start making their masterpiece, then you can call it paint because you want to wait to name it till you've got the behavior. So I'm trying to follow this progression. So once they're doing, once they're doing the full behavior, you, once they've done the full behavior, you then give the treat. Yeah. And then, and then you call it paint. Yeah. When well, you give the you, treat. The whole time you're teaching them the behavior, you're treating them for each progression that they make. Each time you up the ante and at the end, when you're seeing that the dog will do several strokes in a row, and you can help by twisting and turning the, the, the tray so that they're not all, everybody has mm -hmm. to name their painting waterfall in springtime, you know, because it's all a bunch of up and down strokes. You can help them make the different uh, strokes in different directions. But once they've got all those behaviors learned and in their little brains, um, then you can hold up the board just like you've always done and say, paint, and you might tap the top of the board or whatever you've done in the past to make them recognize you're asking for that behavior that they've been working on. So then they start realizing when you say paint, it means go, go to town. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Um, maybe uh, one other, what, what's another trick that an owner can do at home? We've gone through a few so far. Um, what else comes to mind? That's pretty easy for someone to do. Well, um, one of my favorite behaviors um, is panhandling because we use it during fundraising. But that's not so. That's not so something that you'd use at home. Except the same behavior of panhandling, which is taking the dollar bill and putting it in a bucket or in the Salvation Army bucket or whatever. Um, you're you could have the dog learn to put his toys away. It's the same thing. It's tab A and slot B. So. Um, Again, do you want me to go ahead with that one or pick a different one? Yeah, that's a good one, I think. Okay, so um, we do a lot of fundraising for different organizations and for Salvation Army and for um, Dog Scouts of America. And so when we are at these booths, for instance, the Chicago Pet Expo, uh, we have our dog sitting there on a pedestal with all kinds of garb. People walk by and then they go, oh, it's, it's a lie. It's a real dog. I'm like, yeah, they're just really well trained. So there's, they might have sunglasses on and a big spring hat or something and they're holding a bucket in their mouth and they look like they couldn't possibly be a real dog. And, um, and then people go nuts and just start handing over money like crazy. So, and a lot of the other people, for years, the Golden Retriever booth was right next to ours. And they go, you've got to teach our dogs how to collect money like that because it is just, you know, it's a good trick. But, um, so they'll take a dollar. We have signs up that say, my dog will take your dollar and put it in the bucket, you know, try it. <laughs> you know, so everybody bites. And, and once one person, I mean, like, we'll have another activity letting out with a grandstand or something. They're all, all this horde of people are coming down toward our you know, part of the uh, expo. And um, we'll say, quick, you know, get them, get somebody to give them a dollar, even if we have to do it ourselves. And then you see the looks on people's face of, wow, that dog just took the dollar from the guy and he went and put it in a bucket. So um, 
so pretty soon people are lining up literally just standing around in a circle trying to hand the dog money to watch the dog go put it in the bucket and it's it's, it's cute and it's it's good for fundraising and and all that but it, it's basically just a retrieve sort of um you have to get them used to um the item you want them to retrieve being in their mouth and so when we use dollar bills we start out with using used tyvek uh, priority mail envelopes you know they're kind of indestructible so they're not ripping dollar bills in half and everything all the time if they're going to be fetching toys to put in their toy box they're, they're usually pretty comfortable with having their own toys in their mouth so you don't have to worry about that step as much but um you basically have them um have the the, the depository that whatever it's going to be the toy box or the basket mm -hmm. or whatever right right between your legs and you're going to sit in a chair and you're going to call the dog over to you and you can hand him the dollar bill at which point he's going to go and spit it out it's going to go probably in the bucket so you go jackpot yay bingo you got it in there and they don't even know what they've done but they're like okay that worked and then um pretty soon they realize that they're supposed to be you know dropping it in on purpose into the bucket and you can even teach them to target the bucket to help them get better at aiming so like when we were bell ringing for salvation army i taught my sighthound panda um to every now and then to make sure she'd get good with her aim i would uh, put a treat in the bucket and I would click her train. I would reward her for, for targeting the bucket just for putting her head down in the bucket. And, and she, she'd do it and look like, is, is this good enough? And then I'd click her and give her the treat. So she, we were practicing that one time and somebody come up and they said, Oh, did you teach the dog to guard the bucket? Cause there's been so many thefts of the Salvation Army buckets around, you know? And I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because that wasn't what it was. I was just targeting. But, but when she stood there and froze, you know, with her head over the bucket, it looked like she was saying, you can't take my dollars. Oh, funny. Guarding the bucket. But anyway, um, let's go back to the, um, to fetching anything, the toys to put in the toy box or whatever. So once they realize that's the target, you can start moving the bucket or the toy box farther away. And if, if they come and they miss it, I just say, oops you missed and then they'll think well why am I not getting the cookie and they'll realize the thing fell on the floor and not into the receptacle and you know you can teach them to put trash in the trash can it's a it's kind of a useful behavior for a number of things even if you don't do fundraising or panhandling <laughs> <laughs> panhandling is just a joking term for it but it's always for a good cause all right well I think those are pretty good examples of you know what folks can do at home and I think most important is the learning how to learn uh, in terms of the progression that you shared there. So super helpful. So back to, um, back to dog scouts. And when, when, when someone comes to camp, you have all these merit badges on your website. I mean, there's over a hundred of them, it seems like. Mm -hmm. So when someone comes to camp, how many badges would they expect to come away with or that their dog would earn in a, in a typical week? We try to encourage them to limit the amount of badges they go for to just a few, like maybe three or something. But some people just go bananas and they can't help themselves. And we, we tell them, pace yourself. You need free time, too. And there's there's very little free time in the schedule. We do have some mandatory free time in the schedule. But um, the, the rest of it, they've got to pick and choose and just say, well, do I really need to go to water class today? You know, my dog doesn't like water that much anyway, maybe we should take a nap or you know, <laughs> just chill. Um, but still there's the people that just wanna go bonkers and and earn every badge they can possibly do during the week. You know, and that could be like upwards of eight or so. I mean, the people can just, like I say, go nuts. Right, so when you earn a badge, where does a dog wear the badge? We have uh, uniform capes that are okay. little red capes and uh, you sew the badges on the capes. Over the past weekend, we had our jamboree here at the Michigan camp and um, there were the people showing off their capes. There were a number of different styles that, you know, like some people would have their dog's name put on the cape in great big two and a half inch black letters. And I'm like, you're gonna regret you're going to regret that you put that on your cape because there won't be enough room for the badges when you start <laughs> <laughs> when the, as the dog gets older and you're earning all these badges but um uh yeah they just they wear them on their uniform cape and 
uh, it, it's pretty cute. But now, how do people uh, apply or sign up to be part of dog camp? Well, um, we have online registration. Um, they can go to our website and uh, click on camps and read about the camp. There's a lot of pre-camp information to read so that they're prepared. We don't like people to be disappointed. So we try to give them a pretty clear picture that it's a rustic camp, just like when you were a kid going to, um, you know, Boy Scout camp or whatever. Um, and uh, there you can sign up right online and uh, fill out a, a profile of you know your dog what how are his skills how advanced is he does he have any issues is he okay with other dogs is he friendly with people things like that and of course we ask the people same questions yeah are you friendly <laughs> no um that <laughs> you know what like their diet the, anything we need to know or did they, are they on a um, machine that helps them keep them alive or a CPAP or is there right. anything we need to know? I mean, do you have an EpiPen that we need to know the location of, you know, things like that for them to come as well. And so have there been any interesting stories of, you know, dog camp gone bad, for example, like, you know, if you have uh, a, a dog that just isn't a good behaving dog that, you know, doesn't get along with other dogs. How does that well, we've had a few little tussles and things. One, one, um, two sisters came to camp one of the very early years, and they were rooming together, and um, there seemed to be a, a, a little fight about whose sock. It was a, a sock they were using like a dog toy, and um, the two dogs got in an argument over it, and the other dog bit the other, the first dog in the ear. So that was naughty. He had to he had to go out <laughs> to the vet. But um, for the most part, uh, it's 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 run pretty well. I mean, the people are people who have either learned to understand dogs or are learning to understand dogs now that they're at, at camp and um, they don't want to have a bad experience and they don't want to have their dog cause another, mm -hmm. cause a bad experience for somebody else either. So, um, you know, people are pretty good about, um, like in the beginning, we introduce everyone. And if anyone has what we call a yellow bandana dog, that's just, that just means that dog needs more space. He might be fearful. He might be a tad testy about other dogs in his area, which usually means they're fearful. That's usually why they get testy. And um, by wearing the yellow bandana, the other campers know that, okay, he needs some space. I don't want to walk right up to him with my dog and scare, scare him, you know. Got it. Now on your website, you, uh, I noticed you have some, some newsletters and you also talked a bit about funny stories, which are some of your, your favorite things. Can you talk about those two things? Oh, well, I have a funny story that didn't happen at camp. Um, we were, um, we were fundraising one year and, um, and we got a, a grant actually, um, from the people who's, uh, store we were fundraising out in front of and so they uh, wanted to award this to us and we had to meet up with the photographer to take the picture with the big check and everything and um, they wanted to meet us at a local school so my friend and I the friend whose home I'm doing this interview from um, uh, we we're standing in the hallway waiting for the photographer to come and at this woman probably a, a, a teacher comes comes by and she's admiring our dogs. They're so well behaved. They're lying down at our feet and they've got their dog scout uniforms on and everything. And, and uh, she says, wow, what wonderful dogs. They're, they're so well behaved. My dog could never, never do that. What's with the capes and the badge? I said, well, these are dog scouts. She goes, what well, dog scouts, what's that all about? And I said, well, um, it's all about responsible dog ownership. And she's, she's just looking at the dogs and gets ready to leave. And she goes, man, I need to get a responsible dog. <laughs> it's like, no, it's not the dog that's responsible. <laughs> it's the people practicing responsible dog ownership. But I just, I just smiled and let her walk away. I'm like, ah. but I thought that was pretty hilarious myself. Funny. Got to get me a responsible dog. Now, but you document, you document these stories, right? Well, I, um, not really. I just, oh, okay. I, I wrote that one down so I would remember how to tell it right. Um, but, um, I, I should write a book really. <laughs> you should. 
you meet a lot of really interesting people and their dogs and 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 they become like family and um and then when their dog gets older and passes on it it hurts it affects you because it's like mm -hmm. you know they're your nieces and nephews yeah now someone who doesn't live in michigan or the midwest they live on the west coast or down south wherever and it's really a long trip for them to come to, to dog camp so what would you recommend for them well um we have we've had people drive quite a long way even for like a, a weekend event from like all the way from florida and stuff because uh, they just want to be there if they want to be there i guess they will come but um i mean they could they could fly out with their dogs but most people do drive okay. if you have a small dog and it's easier to fly um they sometimes fly but most usually they drive but they could also go to um, the Texas mini camp if that's closer for them and if they want to get involved with dog scouts they don't have to come to camp um, there there could be a troop in their area when when we first started it was mostly the Midwest and then it's just branched out and um, now for instance California has uh, several troops going on out there and um, they have their own what they call camp but it's basically a camp out where they um, they might teach painting or something over the weekend and teach everybody how to do that and and have hikes and cook s'mores over the fire but it's it's basically a camp out that a lot of troops have things like that but um, they have fun doing it so and so so with the troops they're more of just get togethers but there might not be actual training sessions that go on by a, a trained dog scout person like yourself um, most of the troops I think do have those kinds of meetings um, like for instance our troop meeting was yesterday and um, we were doing a little bit of agility and um, finishing up on some badge work that uh, that some of the some of the dogs had gotten some of the miles for their backpacking badge in but needed to finish off a few and then my dog surprise surprise the the tracking instructor um showed up and she goes did you get my email i'm like no and she goes well i thought maybe we could finish kismet's tracking badge today and i'm like ah we haven't been practicing you know but i went and got her and by golly she did so well she got her tracking badge yesterday i'm so proud of her but um yes usually they usually either have a um a guest speaker come in it might be somebody who knows how to administer the um the um, red cross dog first aid or cpr class and they can conduct that for the people um, or um, the one of the california troops has a, a actual forest ranger on their um mm -hmm. in their troop and then she leads the hikes and things like that and um that's that's kind of cool and uh yeah, we usually we usually have some kind of learning experience in the in the troop meetings. Okay, great. Well, yeah, well, I, I saw on the website there, so there's a list of of all the troops and contact information <clears throat> at various ones around around the country. So folks can definitely dive in there. Um, all right, Lonnie. Well, I think we went through some some great history here of of dog scouts and what people can expect at dog camp, along with a few tricks that. Um, you know, puppy owners and even adult owners can take away with them. I think the, you know, learning to learn is a really cool thing. And that's, um, I think that's kind of the, the method that, that I come away with from this chat. So anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Yes, I would like to mention that um, we have 120 badges, but over 10% of those are community service badges. Mm -hmm. I want people to know that we're not just a bunch of crazy people that want to uh, dress up their dogs in capes and earn a bunch of badges like uh, haha look what I've got it's not all about bragging we do a lot of really good work in the community just like the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts do and uh, for doing that work in the community uh, they get badges for that as well so um, believe it or not we've actually gotten hate mail after interviews or, or um, you know media printed media uh interviews and things because they think we're a bunch of crazies and we actually had somebody contact me and say there's uh people starving in asia there's starving children in asia and you guys are taking your dogs to dog scout camp and i'm like well i'm sorry there's starving children in asia and there's groups that take care of that but we're all about trying to stem the the 80 million dogs a year that are killed in shelters because their owners don't know how to 
cope with problem behaviors and things and and um you know we're keeping dogs off the streets i guess hopefully but uh so i i hope people don't hold it against us that we want to have better relationships with our dogs and well thanks for thanks for doing what you're doing and sharing how simple it is to you know engage in a in a relationship and with with your dog and and to you know help help your dog be the best version of them so that they can relate to you the owner the best and which you know makes everyone better in the end so uh, i applaud you well thank you tim it's been nice talking with you all right well nice talking with you lonnie and lonnie olson dog scouts of america at dogscouts.org. Thanks so much, Lonnie. Mm -hmm. Thank you.